Paraclete Press, welcome to this Paraclete Music Talk Back with Jim Jordan. My name is Rachel McKendry and I'm the publicist here at Paraclete. We're thrilled to have you with us today. Today is a day for conversation, so throughout the talk back, I really encourage you to ask any questions you might have. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, or um, you can raise your hand and we can call on you. And please, just any questions you might have for Jim, you're welcome to ask them. I'll be posting links in the chat bar that you can copy and paste to access and purchase the music featured today as well. A heads up that there is a special coupon code, EASY4 2020, for 20% 20 off multiple copy orders of all the pieces featured today. I know you'll want to take advantage of that, and we hope you do. And finally, a recording of this talkback will be available on YouTube for your reference and for anyone who couldn't join us. Now I'd like to introduce Jim Jordan. Jim is the music editor and Gregorian chant specialist for Paraclete Press. He is an organist at the Church of the Transfiguration in Orleans, Massachusetts, and he is a lover of all things Star Trek. Thank you so much, Jim. Thanks, Rachel. It's actually uh, quite fun to get to do this again today now that we're getting into the warmer weather, but it's also fun to see a background change for you and a background change for me that actually are real background changes. Absolutely. So the other thing today, I know Rachel just talked about this, but now I'm going to sound like your favorite school teacher you had growing up and tell you class participation counts as part of your grade. So please, please take advantage of the time if you have any questions about the anthems as we go through. I'd love to talk with you about them and it's not a right or wrong. It's always, uh, what can we do to help you? What can we do to make these anthems more available to you? And what circumstances would they work best in? Anyway, we're gonna start off today with actually one of the most thrilling pieces we have in publication for uh, Easter or Easter Tide. It's entitled, Christ the Lord Has Triumphed Over Death by Ray Widener. And we're lucky enough to have Ray with us today. I'm going to ask him a couple of things in just a moment, but I want to talk about this work for just a couple of seconds and then bring him on. Because we're going to be featuring three of his pieces today. We'll have time to ask him questions. This piece has such an impact. It's a little bit like the impact of Victim A. Pascali Laudis. You open with this wonderful octave uh, blowout, really, of Christ the Lord has triumphed over death, almost an octave recitative before going into these four-part alleluias, which follow that. It's super for an introit. So mark this down if you're looking for anything. But as we go through it, you'll even see the text on page four even relates us now going into Pentecost. So with that, Ray, thanks for being on here today. We very much appreciate it and would love to hear anything you'd like to say about this anthem. Well, happy to be here. Uh, Jim, thanks for uh, inviting me. Um, Absolutely. Well, this, this piece, along with some, uh, so many others, uh, came about in my work at uh, First Presbyterian Church, where I w has been for uh, eight years. And uh, as, as I began composing more and more for churches, I was governed by two uh, principles. Basically, audience was one and resources was the other. And uh, thinking in terms of practicality uh, and ease for choirs to sing. So often you will find in some of my works that uh, sec when qu sections enter, they begin in unison to not only strengthen the, the vocal resources, but it certainly helps add security to the singers. Absolutely. And I just felt that this, this piece was, you know, came out of that uh, tradition in that environment. And uh, I wanted to start it with uh, a nice uplifting flourish and, and not uh, have it be too long of a piece. Well, that's what we were saying actually really will work well as an intro. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at this and listen to it and uh, get, get a real taste for how we could open up an Easter Sunday service.
course, wherever you saw Q notes on that score, that's of the optional brass parts. And we've done that both ways. The demonstration recording you have here is certainly with organ only, uh, but we've actually done it for service with brass, uh, a marvelous addition. Of course, most of us will have brass timpanis, those available on Easter Sunday. And that's not a piece that requires a lot of rehearsal. So we're gonna move on. Ray will be back with us shortly. We have a, two more of his anthems during today's webinar. But now I'm gonna move on to a setting of Wondrous Love by Austin Loveless. We played some of his works last week. Of course, the difference being today, this will be now more for four part and easy anthems for four, four part. But I was looking back towards some of the things that he had done, realizing he still has over a thousand works in publication, which is incredible when you think about that kind of an output. What you're gonna hear in this is a beautiful alternation of voices with underlying organ and also as he puts it, you could have the congregation join in at the end. You'll find as you hear it, it does not require a great deal of rehearsal, but in the early American style, um, something that should fall into place quite quickly because it's so tuneful. Let's take a listen. Mm -hmm. Ooh. 
wasn't exactly thinking um, right about this state and time we are with that final text, but it's kind of um, finally chokes me up just a little bit to look at that, those words. Through eternity, I'll sing on, I'll sing on, as we all face so many questions about what's happening with our church choirs, what will we be doing over these next few months? And as we talked about last week, we know we'll be back singing at some point because we must. It's simply part of us and we have to do it. But that, I love that setting. And of course, there are some marvelous little turns of chromatic phrase at the end of that in the organ accompaniment. And even one C sharp and the soprano, which will get everyone's attention. I love those things because they were a signature of Austin Loveless. They would occur just at small, quick points, but just enough to get your attention right to that particular text. The next on the docket today is a piece entitled, It is Good to Give Thanks by Bob Powell. And we did uh, several of his works last week as well. I was just noting to a friend of mine, what a privilege it is to be in a job like this when you work with some of the composers at whom you publish over a number of years. Because as you see and hear their pieces, you're actually hearing them change as a person. You're seeing what they see by listening to what they're writing. And it's really quite an astounding uh, thing to, to watch it happen. This one really opens with a choral recitative and then it moves into sections to underscore certain parts. So let's listen to It Is Good To Give Thanks for four part and organ. So you can hear in this work such beautiful repetition of patterns with just small variations that the learning will not take long and well worth spending the time to do. Next work, How Lovely Your Abiding Place, Psalm 84, another work by Austin Loveless. Now I know myself, when I think of this text, I don't necessarily think of a foot stomp romp. But this one heads that direction. Austin's actually taken this, and again, it's the early American style, 
put it as the tune wedlock, put it with a light organ accompaniment, and written a number of things actually canonically, and then they come together in octaves, you'll hear that. But bottom line, this anthem is just plain fun to sing. And I think even he notes it, allegro moderato, but then parenthetically, with a definite swing. So he obviously had that in mind. So let's take a listen now to how lovely your abiding place set in this early American style. I mean, really, who wouldn't enjoy just simply coming in and reading that and having that anthem? Uh, you know, you could use that with a smaller group. Uh, it's not difficult. It's basically the tune with some very direct and expected harmonizations and yet enough change in it and enough good solid rhythmic rock to make everybody want to stand up and shout. So, we're gonna move again to another piece by Ray Widener, God Be In My Head. Uh, but beforehand, Ray, I've just gotten a question, or actually a comment, the a discussion comment from one of our um, new composers here at Paraclete, and a younger composer. And he's actually wondering about how a composer writes functional and accessible music with harmonic interest. Uh, which he admits freely that is a personal obsession of his. And I have to say, I understand that myself. So Ray, you want to give that a, a little bit of discussion with me here? I have a few thoughts, but I want to know yours. Well, I think there are <clears throat> two different issues that don't necessarily need to go together. Um, I, I agree that uh, there, there's a lot of music these days that tends to be harmonically uh, static, and, uh, and that was probably the big gestation for God Be In My Head. You know, we're familiar with the Walford Davies right, version right. of that. And uh, I felt that harmonically, it, it, it isn't as interesting as I think that setting could be. But that's, you know, that's just my personal taste. Uh, harmonic uh, vocabulary is something, you know, one has to develop, I suppose. And So, Ray, uh, can I just quickly interrupt you on that? Sure. Because one of the reasons that we wanted to publish your setting of this piece, because I think this is an important point to underscore, is because of its harmonic simplicity. Because I want to make sure, especially if you have any other composers listening, that um, the very simplicity lets some elements of the text come through where a more harmonically complex work might not. Anyway, I just wanted to make sure, uh, you know, Ray makes that point, 
but as we listen to it to understand uh, why we chose it. Go ahead, yeah. Ray. Yeah, th this this piece is is not uh, harmonically um, uh, aggressive in any way, but uh, melodically it, it it tends to move around uh, a little bit and and has some sort of thematic interest to it. So there's there's the harmonic element and then there's the motivic element. I think that. Uh, mm -hmm makes makes music interesting and and this this particular piece the text is short enough that uh, if if you wander off too much and and put too much um, harmonic interest into it then you begin to distract from things like the basic text absolutely and as I was looking at it I was reminded um, we often talk about ways that we're able to teach these works to choirs uh, and a perfect warm-up before teaching this would be singing a D major scale because as you listen to this you're going to see that the melody and the motives certain circle D major and B minor and often are often used then to set up the next phrase of the of the actual poem Plus, the other element here, Ray, which I found wonderful uh, in the piece is uh, range, because you do build it very clearly over to God be in my heart and in my thinking. Uh, and so it really, it helps when we have the choirs to say, you know, just look at what's actually happening. So let's take a listen to God be in my head by Ray Widener. You know, undoubtedly, this would be an anthem that would catch your choir's heart quite quickly, because if you if you approach it with some of these ideas in mind, the difficulty level of anything really disappears because they can hear the beauty of what is being said in that text. Next piece, I heard the voice of Jesus say, this is an arrangement by Betty Carr Polkingham, who we were privileged to work with over many years. And this is an interesting setting because it's unison and optional SATB and organ. I.e., if you want, you can sing the soprano line all the way through, and it's effective either way. It's also very early American style. It's based on Kingsfold and the third tune. Uh, you can look those up. There's a real introspective sense and approach to this particular early American piece. Uh, of course, you hear all of the bright modal and pentatonic sounds, but I think she was after something slightly different in this one. Because you're listening to, I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. There's a certain amount of invitation in this that would make this appropriate for a lot of different, uh, appropriate for a lot of different occasions. So let's take a listen now to I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say.
Okay, so I have to confess in putting the pieces together for today, it was not intentional in my part to have so much early American sound, but I sure do love it. It's an incredible thing, really, when you listen to this hymnody uh, set in these choral versions taken from early American uh, tunes and early American songbooks. Uh, you can hear why they stuck with generations orally and why people continue to sing and sing and sing them, even in their original forms with all the shape note groups that are around today. Just, just a marvelous setting of those pieces. So now we're actually going to uh, our last piece of today with Ray Widener. Uh, it's a setting of a New Year carol. Now, I'm doing something today I don't normally do, and that is have two different versions of a similar text. But these are so strikingly different. Uh, we've got another one in just a few minutes that's quite a big, uh, what I would call just a fabulously happy dance. Ray's setting approaches this from a very different viewpoint and it's quite enough, I wouldn't say introspective, but it's thoughtful. And these approaches are both valid and I should they say even equally needed depending on the occasion. But Ray, I'd love to hear a little bit more about this particular uh, piece and if you had any uh, other thoughts about it when you wrote it. Yes, uh, here, here again, there's the element of practicality that enters into the picture. Uh, mm -hmm. Many of us uh, in churches, there are periods when uh, our vocal resources are rather low. Right. And uh, over, over the Christmas holiday, especially around New Year's, uh, we can be faced with the small performing resources. So I wanted to write something that uh, can come across very well, even with limited resources. Even though this is in, in four parts, in, in some cases, it doesn't necessarily have to be performed in, in four parts. So that was, that was one element of it. Another element is that uh, I, I always like the uh, English tradition, and so this is kind of in that tradition with the macaronic text of, right. uh, of a Latin uh, refrain, and uh, which I added to it. And then, then of course, I wanted to um, just just have a basic, simple uh, way of of hooking the the new year of our calendar with a new year in Christ. And so uh -huh. I, I I've, I've often write my own hymns and my own poems. And so this, obviously, the, the text was, was my own. And uh, uh, I think it, it harnesses those two things together so that, uh, you know, as we go through the liturgical year, we use the current year in our lives and in the church to strengthen our faith as we grow in our faith each year. So that, that was basically the, uh, the genesis uh, of that. Well, it's, it's a, just a marvelous setting. And we actually took uh, your suggestion of women in unison and extended it in our uh, recording we did here uh, and placed men in unison on the second verse and on the third we went to parts uh, and I do think it gives it, it's a very nice uh, tonal color difference between the first and second verses. So Ray, then, uh, this being the last one of yours on here, I'm going to publicly thank you for joining us today on this and I know you put this together at the last minute for us, but I can't tell you how glad I am. And oh, you're welcome. Happy to do it. Absolutely. And thank you again. So here is Ray Widener's New Year Carol.
Well, and you can certainly hear that the piece does exactly what Ray said, both from a practical standpoint and certainly from the spirit of the piece, because it allows you to be drawn right in to the message that's being put across. Next is a piece, and I'm going to publicly apologize. I have never had the opportunity to speak with this particular composer. Uh, only via email have we communicated. So I'm not sure if he pronounces his last name Galatar or Galater. But his first name is Charles. That much I can tell you for sure. And this is his anthem on the prayer of St. Francis. And particularly right now, I think it's an appropriate text to offer to everybody. Again, we hear a lot of uh, octave unison writing uh, spreading out, going back and forth. What I find most interesting about this work though, um, he does have use of hocket where we have women and men answering, uh, not exactly call and response because it's not the same music, but in terms of characterization of the text. And then a beautiful uh, soprano descant toward the end, I think you'll enjoy. So this is Anthem on the Prayer of St. Francis.
just a lovely, lovely setting of that work. Okay, now, as promised earlier, the other piece, A Carol for the New Year. Now I'm gonna uh, present this to you just slightly differently. A few weeks ago with Robert Lau, we talked about the idea of not letting your choir open the score before they heard the music and had a chance just to listen to it. Well, we're going to do that with Mike Bedford's setting of A Carol for the New Year. And for the moment, we're gonna just play a little bit of the anthem and I want you to actually sit back and close your eyes and kind of just tap right along. Dan, if we can do that, and I'll holler when to stop. Okay, so right there, well, as Virgil Fox used to say, if you didn't have a smile on your face, you're seated in the wrong pew, because that it's just such a fun piece to listen to, and of course follows the same meter pattern as I Want to Be in America of Bernstein. But what's so wonderful is the tune just catches you so fast. And of course, it's such a wonderful way to get a choir hooked, because when you open the score, Oftentimes, our opinions come flying up about what's difficult and what isn't. And I thought this piece was well worthy of showing for this very reason, because once you learn what you just heard, you've learned the vast majority of this work. So now let's actually watch and listen to A Carol for the New Year. piece is just a blast. There's no way around that word. It just is. It reminds me of so many William Matthias anthems. Uh, William Walton, uh, of course, Matthias said all music is supposed to be jubilant praise and really a celebration. And that's exactly what that piece is. And actually, you can see using that setting and raise in the same service and achieving two very different ends. But I can't recommend them highly enough, either one of them. So the last piece that we're going to have today uh, is a setting of All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. This is by Michael McCabe, and this is part of our Hymns of Praise series. 
that we've actually talked about now for several weeks, where composers write a, a hymn, basically it's a hymn anthem, uh, for organ, choir, congregation, trumpet, or another instrument. The purpose being to unite us all in singing. Now, that's all the stuff over to the side. Every time I listen to this particular setting, I tend to choke a little bit because Michael found representation of emotion within the text, unlike many I have ever heard at all. Uh, the various colors of the verses, uh, when you're, you just, the pictures that come to mind when you listen to this piece, if you'll let your imagination run wild as you listen to it, don't even concern yourself so much with watching the score. It's not that difficult. That's part of the reason we have it on here for today. You'll obviously hear the trumpet part. Let yourself be soaked up in the emotion and the subtext of this music on Perinet's text, who he himself suffered so much uh, as a, in the days when Methodists were still persecuted. And of course, this hymn is what's become known really as the national anthem of Christianity and itself is in over 2,300 hymn collections. So here is All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name by Michael McCabe. <laughs>
I hope that that is a piece that you will actually really go back and listen to uh, with the rest of these, of course, but to really get a good soaking in what he's actually saying in that hymn. Well, thank you all again for joining me today here on the webinar, looking at some easier works for poor parts. We will be back again with you next Thursday. Uh, thanks again to Ray Widener for joining me today, talking about his pieces. And I'm gonna emphasize again, be thinking of your questions because we really do want to have them. So Rachel, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jim. And thank you, Ray, and to all of you who joined us today. You'll be getting an email with a link to the recording of today's talkback and a link to all the music that was featured. A reminder that if you use the coupon code EASY42020, on multiple copy orders of any of these pieces, you'll get 20% off. Your choirs may not be getting together and singing together just yet, but we know that they will be. So it's the perfect time to get your resources together. Please take advantage of this special and get your copies now. Again, that coupon code is easy 42020 and the links are in the chat bar here and on the Paraclete Sheet Music website. Also, just as a reminder, right now there's a 25% discount on all organ music. No minimum purchase is required. Use the coupon code ORGAN25 at checkout. Now, Jim also wanted me to let you know that if you have requests of specific pieces that you'd like to hear him talk about, please email me at rachelm at paracletepress.com. That's the same address that your link invitation to join the talkback usually comes from. So send me an email, and if we can include that piece, we will. We hope you enjoyed this time together as much as we did today, and we hope you'll join us for more of these Paraclete Music talkbacks. The calendar is available on our website, paracletesheetmusic.com. Our prayers are with all of you for health and safety. God bless you, and we hope to see you next Thursday. Thanks again.